Nothing's better than the skull candies, Buffs. Nothing. Yes, guys, welcome back to the Canon Podcast. How you doing? Hope you're doing very, very well. Thank you so much for being here. It's all hot and up, isn't it, lads? And it's not just my room. <laughs> oh, it's, it's 30, 30 degrees. You, you guys think it's hot in the UK? It's not cold in Philly either. I'll tell you that. Tell you Humid that. land. Look, I've come from the east, uh, the west coast, so where it's hot there, yeah, yeah, wherever. But it's dry heat. It's not humid at all. You don't, you don't actually end up sweating. In Philly, it's completely opposite. Too much, too much. We've had you had quite the the busy time, Baz. We'll certainly get to that. Yeah, yeah, we so want much. to talk about uh, obviously the Califuri news. We want to talk about the United game. Uh, I realise, boys, that the Premier League starts again two weeks on Friday. <laughs> yeah, it's it's yeah. all coming around, and also I mean, cup is on more importantly, it, way more importantly, the the real trophy everyone wants to win. And um, Saka and Rice and stuff are back in training this weekend. So it feels like a lot sort of um sort of starting to happen. So I hope you guys are doing well. Make sure you're subscribed if you're watching us on YouTube. Uh, if you're listening to us on Spotify and Apple as well, thank you so much. Make sure you leave a review and all that sort of good stuff. But Bavs, let's come to you first because you have had quite the forty eight hours, and I don't want any humble humbleness from you. You're a humble man. So I want you to tell first and foremost to say what you put in the group yesterday because I think this is really, really cool. Yeah, yeah. So um, obviously I was given access to California's first training session, right? Um, because I've got press passes in, in the USA. So I've been able to go to the games, press conference before games, after the games. And uh, this had an opening training session. So they got there. It was open to the fans and to the media as well. But we were given media access after. Um, so we've gone to the training session. That's amazing in the first place. You see all the players, you see all the background staff at Arsenal as well, which, you know, I'm starting to familiarise myself with, which is crazy in the first place. People at my club that I know. Um, and we got a few little exclusive accesses and stuff, which I'm not going to go into too much detail. But it's just good to have that there. Just as an Arsenal fan, forget it. As an Arsenal content creator, I think that's just amazing. Um, and I think it's come towards the press conference time. And for some reason, I've kind of just stayed out. And I said, I don't want to go in. I want to just stay in this area where all the players are. I just have a feeling something's going to happen. I just, just had a feeling and that's, that's what it was. So two of our guys went into the press conference. We stayed inside, stayed outside. Then me, James and Turkish, we walked inside to like a, a almost like a, because this isn't a, a, a stadium, right? Uh, what's that place called? Is it a turnstile area where, you know, you enter as a fan and you got all like the, the shops and stuff straight away, yeah, right? Yes. In the concourse, the concourse, right? So we're on the concourse of the Philadelphia Eagle Stadium and we're just chilling there outside the toilet, just waiting for the press conference to end. And uh, a few Arsenal staff walked past, which is, okay, of course, that's normal, just as it is. But we just played it cool. No. And then Gilberto Silva walked past us as well uh, with Theo Walker. Gilberto came over and said hello to us, which is, again, I just found nice. crazy. Yeah. <laughs> then Zinchenko just starts walking over. And, and obviously, like, he's an Arsenal player, which Arsenal fan goes, go up to the trailer, get a photo. But we just played the cool. Like, yo, just calm down, man. It's, cool. it's all right. It's all right. Just, just, just wait. And he walks over to us now. I'm like, okay, this is a bit crazy. So shakes all over hands. And I was like, okay, this is that's all I wanted. Like, you know, just to even shake your hand, just have interaction. And he just walks off a little bit. and He goes, what's the five things we learned from this then? And I was like, I was like, I was like, what? And I, in a moment, I played it. I played it very cool. Like, okay, so that's, yeah. that's, that's pretty nice. But inside, I was like, Whoa. yeah, of course. That's just it's crazy because it's it's like. I mean, in a tour last year, I had a, a few interactions with the players just like saying hello and that. And I was like, mm. that's probably just a normal thing. Like just nice. But this was like, okay, this was real. Like it's yeah. very specific. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it, it, it felt it's, very nice. It's such validation for the, for the work you do. It's, it's so cool, yeah. man. And like, also like in theory, you know, even with my own content, you you think like, I'm sure someone watches, like I'm yeah, sure someone yeah. does, but until so, you, until you know, and someone says yeah. something like that, it's so cool. It's so cool. I think I spoke to uh, one of the head guys at Arsenal, basically behind the scenes, and he was very familiar with basically everyone. Like and I've, if I was mentioning names to him, cause he's like, I was asking him questions that I'm like, oh, so what do you think of ITKs? And what do you think of all this type of stuff? And he, he wasn't, do you know what I mean? He was just let, going off at all the real. So he, he knows about most of it and they know about most of it as well. And I think, I think the, the crazier part for me was actually that was very nice for myself. Now the press conference is over. We've gone outside and um, we're just outside the stadium now. Fans could be there if they want, but we're just there. We're getting out all our, our content posted on social media and stuff. And just standing there, me and the AFTV lot, we look outside the stadium just next to us and Ethan Wanieri, Martin Odegaard, Ben White and Urien Timber are all just walking literally next to us. And so again, play it cool. It's fine. Let's, let's not film. Let's lock the cameras up. Yeah. <laughs> And I think Martin sees Eva Robbie, and yeah. even though like we didn't go up to them, they came over to us. Yeah, yeah. And again, it just shook hands. Very, very nice. Everyone said hello. Yuri and Tim came up and started saying to everyone, "Hi, Yurian. Like we don't know who you are." 
Hey, well, we know polite. who you are, mate. That's Jared. very polite. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I played for Arsenal. I don't know if you've heard of yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. But again, very, very nice. Again, very natural interactions. But yeah, yeah. that again was another like, okay, look, Martin's looked at us and gone, look, these guys are content creators. They yeah, obviously yeah. know who we are in a sense. And they've gone, let's yeah. go over. And we've heard play it very cool as well. And, and it's just a, a nice thing to do, you know, as, as a captain. When literally a minute later, an Arsenal fan just saw him from distance start shouting, mm. oh my God, oh my God, it's Martin Erdegaard. He had a signed sack of shirt. He started. I think it was the guy that cried about the Ben White thing. That's, that was the same person. He had the same shirt. Do you know that? Have you seen a video of Ben White uh, signing a shirt and the, and the person crying? No, I haven't seen that. That, sa- seen that same that. person, he, he was just looting around the ground. Yeah. He just spotted all four, five Arsenal players and ran over. I was like, wow. I mean, there, there's a whole conversation for another day about like, of course, like the club do oh, need to know it. what's be <laughs> five things we learned. Like what the club, you know, the, the club need to know what's going on. The club need to know. And it's, it's part of their job, especially the guys who work in media and stuff, to know what is being said about the club. It's, it's important to know. Uh, that's probably a conversation for a, for another day. But I mean, I it's so there's cool. there's more this... to that, mate. Like, there's, there's absolutely logic. Look, from any business angle, you have to know what the fans are talking and the pulse of that. And it, I think it goes beyond just, you know, checking on Twitter and checking on accounts and whatnot. I mean, I do think not to... Um, not to like praise you guys like too, too much, but I mean, you guys are big influences in terms of an Arsenal community and everybody is, and we hope that our voices reach that far. But I mean, I think when you start uh, talking about the club and you garner the attention that everybody has, you know, journalism is not what it was 20 years ago. It's not just, you have to have a certain press pass and you have to make articles and you have to do that. I mean, content creators are the new way forward for a lot of journalism and that's modern journalism. And so I think that relationships with clubs Generally speaking, I think that's just the start, mate. And I mean, it's it's crazy that you've been able to do that, Babs. Like, you must have been ecstatic. But I, I think this is the start of something that moves forward. Like, in the next five years, it wouldn't surprise me that, you know, people get invited on tour and that they're able to start yeah, sharing yeah. content I mean, you can see creation it with Frimmy. See it with Sharky as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Them, them guys are there as well. And they, you know, Arsenal are going towards that route. Most clubs are, to be fair. Um, I think the access is just... It's just crazy. Just like uh, even a few few days prior before the United game, I was there was like a, a before the press conference before the game there was like a, a LA Rams event, mm. and you just walk into the event and you think oh there's just like an LA Rams player maybe, Josh Kroenke's there, Stan Kroenke's there, Richard Carlick's there. They're all just like standing next to you, and I, I think I saw I posted a video on Twitter of me approaching Josh and I think someone filmed it and so it looks yeah. just like very nice. You met him right? Like, you met Josh? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I mean James for example had a full on combo with him, like a full yeah. five minute conversation. Like it wasn't like a hi bye kind of vibe. Yeah. Like they were all chilling there, and I'm just like. That access there, even though it's like you try to play it cool in the moment, but you don't want to be like fanboying. Oh my god! Oh my god! It's all these. But these are the guys so cool. that you've seen on TV and yeah. heard about, and I was about it. Like especially like the the execs like Richard Garlic and Co. And they just there, and yeah. in front of you, you can ask them whatever you want. Obviously, yeah. you know, they want to be stupid, but you can ask them whatever you want. And so, what just did you say? Alone, so I just I just said hello. I wasn't I wasn't gonna go up to him and say like, yeah. Hey Josh, who are we signing this summer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. But James started asking about all sorts of stuff. You know? I'm gonna I'm gonna off. text James and ask him what he said. Yeah, James had a full-on five-minute convo. I bet there's, and the I funny bet there's thing stuff was, he won't share as well. Yeah, I mean, nah, I, I think he'll be fine with you. But I think it's just one of those where I think after the convo, someone come up to him and was like, just just make sure it stays within the convo. Yeah, like, yeah, it doesn't yeah, yeah, leaked yeah. into the to the world of media. Um, and yeah, I, I, what I see, what I've noticed this entire trip is, do you know how there's always this talk about do Arsenal like content creators, do they like AFTV and all that type of stuff? Speaking to people behind the scenes at Arsenal, the, the, the culture is changing. There's a lot of new guys in, on the board. Um, they're very nice, very sound. They're very, in, in, you know, up to date with what's happening. And they're very opening. Uh, and it's, it's very nice as an Arsenal fan, you know, forget even as a content creator, to be able to speak uh, uh, yeah. to people at the club and just, you know, uh, establish some sort of relationship. Those, those things, yeah, they're, they're really important. It's also mutually beneficial. Like, I, I don't, you know, obviously it's really cool for, for you know, someone like you, perhaps to be able to go and do that and have those conversations and meet those people and stuff. These are like my heroes, trying to be able to do that. But equally, you know, narrative we speak about it narratives matter you know conversation matter and if they can control it in a yeah yeah and you know that i think sometimes that there's yeah. this sort of you know oh thank you so much you know i appreciate it. but you've got power yourself mate like you know the, to have that to, to sort of put information out there so it's mutually yeah. beneficial i think it's yeah i mean it's so it's so cool it's so cool yeah it's, it's, it's the key part especially the zinchenko part as well oh. like minutes before that i think me and someone else talking about him as a player leaving potentially and no one really said like oh he has to get rid of him but we're just talking about that and minutes later he comes over and he yeah. does that to me and i'm like well, i yeah. want to keep him now yeah oh, <laughs> <laughs> he's got I've, I've met him in person once he's got great teeth zinchenko i remember, I remember looking at yeah i wasn't i wasn't wow. analyzing his teeth to be fair <laughs> <I> um, <was. laughs> but but yeah no the thing is he was openly having convos with a lot of people yeah. as in fans yeah. he wasn't and i like that about him you can see it, you've seen it before in social media as well where he's kind of gone and uh, interacted with the fans and it's 
but off cameras as well. He's, he's really extroverted. Camera. Like I think you see it in a lot of interviews. Like he's really open about trying to almost put a lens into the topic of professional football. And like to be honest with you, mate, like look, we all love it and we talk as best as we can and we each have our own expertise, but these guys are a different level. They really are the one percent of the one percent in terms of the sport. And like uh, I, I do think that moving forward, content creation has a space in terms of being maybe the go-to reference, if not, like not to big up this path that we're all on. But I mean, I do think that moving forward, you're going to see less and less movement towards traditional journalism and more and more movement towards social content creation and using that and maximizing that. I mean, look at the engagement and, you know, in terms of some of the short videos that Arsenal have done, all the videos to fans, the connections, like it matters. And you can see that, Arsenal think about these things. I mean, one of the best things that I saw with Calafiore maybe as a smooth transition was that little video that they did with the little Italian shop. That's like a portion of like a neighborhood business with Arsenal. And they've really been doing that lately in terms of really propping up the city where they're from and North London in general about using promos and almost kind of introducing players via fan social media content. Like it is kind of new. I haven't seen it too often. And it's great, mate. It's great. I, I think that it's Arsenal in embracing the times. But like you said, I agree. It's a level of controlling the narrative. And it's just smart business, right? Like the fans do make up who you are as a club. So to be able to control that voice, I know it's weird, but I have an analogy. It's like the small folk in a town. You've got like a king, queen, and a royal quote. You know, you've got so many fans. And controlling that narrative is going to be far more important than absolutely anything in terms of journalism, in terms of whatever report gets sent out on any player. If you can control the narrative of a fan base, that's the power of a club. If you're if you're watching House of the Dragon at the moment, you know you know there how you important go. that is. <laughs> <laughs> is that where you're, where you're going from? That's hilarious. Yeah, yeah. It's, but it's true, it's true. I won't spoil it for anyone, but you know, it's very important. Um, so basically, Babs, when's Zinchenko coming on the pod? <laughs> Should be soon. Should, Should be, be soon. soon. Should yeah, be we'll soon. Speak, we'll speak soon. Uh, of course, amid all of that, uh, which is really exciting, I think, you know, obviously those sort of insights and stuff will, will, will come up over the course of the summer and, and moving forward. Um, Califiori was announced. Uh, uh, just as the, and to, speaking of controlling the narrative, just as the Emil Smith Rowe news came out, I didn't think that yeah. was necessarily yeah. not a coincidence, considering we know what uh, people behind the I mean, scenes do know. It's weird one because he we, when we got to the Philadelphia we, we asked about Bill and he wasn't a part of the tour he, he wasn't he didn't come over so it, it was kind of a real plan that he was on a go because he wasn't coming to Philadelphia so but I do understand it because it's straight in and it goes yeah. like okay look we've signed Kyle Fury people forget about Bill straight away but that's the thing a lot of Arsenal fans are very emotional about Bill um, and, and you can sense it like across social media. 100%. We'll, we'll come to that in, in, in a second. Uh, yeah, because I think there's, there's a lot to discuss there. But uh, yeah, Calafuri was announced. He's number 33. Uh, there's some comments from Edu and Mikel. Mikel has said, we welcome Ricardo and his family to Arsenal. He's a great sign. He gives us huge strength and reinforce our defence. Ricardo's a big personality and character with specific skills, George, which will make us stronger as we push to win major trophies. He's already shown great development in recent seasons with the performances for both Bologna and Italy with, with his progression and development in the past year being really impressive. I think he said later on that he's been tracking for over a year uh, Edu obviously gave some comments as well sort of similar sort of stuff I found probably the most intriguing maybe part and George I'll come to you first on this of his announcement was around the interview and I don't know if you guys saw it but there was a uh, part of the interview where the interviewer said you know you're joining a statistically very very good defense how do you feel about that and do you feel you'll kind of earn your right to play and the captions on that video don't do it justice. So I'd, I'd, I'd recommend and sort of watching it in person. Don't, don't uh, sorry, um, just reading it. Don't quite do it justice. I'd recommend everyone go and watch that and watch his answer. It's quite telling. It's quite interesting. He just says, "I came here to play, honestly," and then he carries on. But it's there's a there's quite a security there. There's quite a a sense of you know we listen. Let's use that word. The yeah, aura. The aura is there. You know, he doesn't look 22 as well. And I saw that oh, photo, photo you posted of him chasing the girls. Oh. Um, he wasn't chasing the girls. That was not chasing the girls. It was just, that's the Arsenal player liaison. You knew what you, you know, were doing. You knew what you were doing. But it was just a photo of kind of fury. That's what sure, it was. sure, sure, sure. Um, but George, come to you first. Obviously, you know, really, really good news. Great to see him uh, lining up. I love that bit in the, the, um, the announcement video where he asked Mikel, if, is this real? And Mikel said, it's real. Um, but look, Bav's kind of said it there, a real maturity, something, someone that feels really uh, like he's going to integrate pretty quickly. Um, I'm really excited to see him. I think we might be able to see him against Liverpool. But yeah, how are you feeling about the announcement and, and the deal as a whole? Brilliant. I, I think he, he's an incredible prospect. He's definitely not somebody that I had highlighted before the window. And then 
when you see him and you see the profile that that is, like, this was a big yes for me in all aspects in terms of the value for the deal at the present moment, in terms of raising your potential ceiling, in terms of actively in the moment being a floor raiser in addition to being a ceiling raiser, all for a package of 42 million pounds all in with add-ons. I mean, that's in today's market, it's absolutely incredible. And, you know, I, I think a really interesting thing for me in the interview, you know, you had mentioned to Alex, I think he's coming to stay, he's coming to play. Like, you know, that, that comment I think was not, um, it was pretty loaded <laughs> in my opinion. Like he's, yeah, go watch it. It's interesting. It's interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, but, but also it's what I expected. You know, I think I, I definitely saw this signing as a starter. I didn't see this signing as, you know, a potential depth signing. Um, you know, this is somebody that in the moment is absolutely very raw, but um, in the moment it's going to really raise the level of our team and I think is going to l- raise the level of what we can do. There probably could be a better discussion about what he gives us in terms of buildup, in terms of the tempo of our buildup, and in terms of him carrying the ball into central spaces and, inter- and what that knock-on effect does. Because there was many times last season that I just felt our entry pass from our goalkeeper or our first phase and getting into the middle of the park seemed to be slow at times. It lacks central progression at times. And we were trying to find ways and debate ways here in the podcast how we can improve that. And I think on his own, he's able to do that in addition to those long switches, which are brilliant. And I think that they actually are to a world-class level. And we do see him offer quite a bit of flexibility. And the one thing that I love about him is he's just truly a modern footballer. And he seems like an incredible mental profile. That's the one thing that I wanted to end on because I think people talk aura and you can talk about the casual conversations in regards to that. But I mean, it's not horrible analysis. I mean, you look at defenders and you need to trust them. You need to see that a stalwart is able to give you that reassuring nature that they can deal with chaos. And that is what Calafiore does brilliantly. That for me is his superpower. It's his mental attitude. Um, and it just, uh, yeah, I was ecstatic with the signing, ecstatic it's finally through. And I'm really excited to see how he changes our left-hand side dynamic. Yeah. I think, um, you know, it's, it's maybe it's seen as kind of agricultural analysis or something. Or so, I don't know what the phrase would be, but, you know, we know players have said you would face up against the Invincibles and you'd look at them in the tunnel and you'd go, we're beaten. And okay, you can, you can talk tactics all you want, but if that's how you feel in the tunnel, then that, that's a competitive advantage. So I think it's, you know, these things aren't, yes, okay, they can be laughed about, but they're also genuinely a competitive advantage. But I was on the ground then in, are you in Philly or LA? You're on mute is where you are. <laughs> I am on mute, but I am also in Philadelphia. Okay, cool. So what, what's the feeling sort of on the ground about Caliber? I mean, there must be a lot of excitement. And also you saw him in person. He is a unit. An absolute unit, I'll tell you that for a fact. And you know, we talk about like aura and stuff, and we always we see it on social media now. It's just if people find you attractive, you've got aura. But mm. seeing him in person, just how he interacts with the coaching staff and the other players, he didn't look shy whatsoever. And I remember when, when we signed Kivio, I think we saw some articles about him going into the dressing room and stuff, and he felt like an outsider, a bit shy. Calafrio looks like he's straight in, you know, interacting with the players, going up to everyone, having conversations. I think it helps that he's very fluent in English, which surprised me by how yeah, fluent he was. English was great, really Very good. good. And so good so that, you know, after the media, of, of the transition's over, he's come over to the media and had given a full-on interview. Not many players do that, especially when they've just signed. You know, how, how many times do you go straight to the media you know, who, you know, who can rip you apart at times and ask you all the questions that you're being comfortable with. So, yeah, a lot of confidence, a lot of assurance in how he acts and how he talks as well. I think that's that's what caught me off guard is I thought, like, I thought he might know a bit of English, but to be that fluent straight away, it's going to play a massive part. And you can see with the way he's interacting with some of the players, he doesn't look like he's out of place or he's scared or he's intimidated. You can just sense from his, his just persona, he's very much like, I'm at home and I know what to do. Yeah, he was speaking really well. I think I think the English thing is not to be underrated. Like it's it's massive, massive. and it, it, it's it's really good. I was really impressed because by it. Not every Arsenal coach is obviously Italian, not even Spanish. Like there's other Arsenal coaches that don't speak those languages. So for him to communicate with them, because I think he's speaking to an English Arsenal coach, you know, normally there was no like you could see that there was no barrier involved, and that's massive. You know, yeah. and even the attacks of Yover and Kozoi. I think that's the massive thing with him, Kivio. Is Kivio, even in person to this day, he gives you a very shy persona with how he plays and training as well and how he's you know, doing his thing. Whereas you, California looks very much like, I'm assertive. I deserve to be here and this is my place. Yeah, no, it's it's really impressive. And I think um, 
there's an interview he did with who sort of sort of by the side of the pitch or something and he was talking about and he was even saying you know that picture of me that was that was fake and you know he was sort of he was being quite assertive in saying you know someone asked him about the position or whatever and he was just saying look i don't want to talk too much i'm just going to play mm-hmm. and all that stuff is, is really really good signs just coming on to actually briefly before we come on to that what do we think am i i'm probably being me and reading way too much into something there was a picture on the board when Ar- when Arteta was announcing it they said Arsenal 2.4 am I is this just like second week fourth day or are we thinking are we midway through the project or what, what are we saying I think this is Arsenal yeah this is yeah this is me desperate for anything this is me desperate for anything uh let's be, I thought I'd try my luck let's move on um but I'll come back to you I mean obviously he said he feels you know I'll play anywhere whatever and yes, that's fine. That's nice for the for the for the media. It's nice for us to hear. But he's going to play somewhere. Yeah. He is. Do you get? I mean, yeah. I mean, fine. Do you get the sense? What What do you sense that will be? Because I think George is, is bang on, and we kind of forget about last season, our central progression issues. It was a topic on this podcast for probably about two months. <laughs> we would talk yeah. pretty much every week about how we get more access to the central areas, and it feels like with Bojiri and Simba, and with um, and also by the way, Mikel Marino, if he signs, I think will help us with this as well. Um, but also, yeah, with Calafiori, because we've got a lot of options centrally. Rohan Jivan, who's been on the podcast before, has spoken about he feels as though Calafiori will be maxed out, let's say, at centre back. What's your feel on that? Like, what what do you get the sense he'll start at left back and maybe sort of move there, or like what are your predictions? I think is he's got the aggression to play centre back. I think like, I saw a video of him versus Ossiman going doing the rounds yesterday. You could see straight yeah. away like he's not a stand up type of defender. He'll get in your face, and he's strong and he's big, and you can see it in person as well. But I feel like from the start, you know, we all know it's going to be left back, you know, and it's weird because when you got Yuri and Zemba, you think who's going to stop? But you know, certain games you can change out. Alex, Alex will always say, you know, it's different game states need different players. We've got that now, and I think I asked someone at Arsenal, I said to him like, you know, so what does this mean for Kivio's future? What does it mean for Zinchenko? And it's like he goes, Mikel has always wanted eight top defenders and we have eight top defenders now maybe not all elite 1v1 but they all have different types of strengths you know if you really need to bring someone on to progress the ball you've got a player that you can start either in Calafuri, you can bring on uh, Yuri and Timber or Zinchenko you know and that's very important to have and so my feeling is that the first couple of years we'll see a left left back but again you know I wouldn't be surprised if Mikel was to start him in a few games centre-back because let's not forget the start of last year prior to Timber getting injured Gabriel was on the Arsenal bench right there was rumours going going about maybe going to Saudi Arabia. There was uncertainty. And then Timber got injured and came back into the team and no one kind of talked about it. And yes, he made the PFA team of the year last year, but we've seen Ramsdale, you know, make the team of the year and it not really matter. So if Mikel sees something that he wants specifically and he can improve upon, even if us, us as fans don't see it, like we didn't see Ramsdale and Raya, he will go and do it. And so I'm very intrigued to see what we see sometimes. Maybe Timber starts as a left back and California centre back. It, it's it's going to be very intriguing to see. So I think the first game of the season, if we're going to start him, and if he comes off the bench against Liverpool, it will be as a left back. Yeah, George, it's a tactical discussion. I don't want to leave you out because I'm, I know you'll you'll cry. But I think um, just something to sort of tee you up with. I think last season we felt as though there was a, sort of the three Saliba, Gabriel, and White, and then the left back slot was the one that was the, the sort of rotator. I found it really interesting in the press conference yesterday when Mikel was asked about this, and he identified that one of the main reasons for signing Calafiori was the fact that William Saliba played so many minutes. I mean, that, that's interesting to me. I don't think, unless you do, I don't think that necessarily means that Calafiori is going to play either right centre-back or centre-back. I don't see him playing particularly in the zone, certainly not at first, or, or maybe you do, and I, I could be wrong. But I, I feel we're going to see more rotation in the central areas. I think we are going to see more... Uh, maybe even Saliba coming over to the, to the left-hand side, Saliba dropping out, White coming inside, Gabriel dropping out, Calafiori coming in. I think we felt last season we really had that stability with Saliba and Gabriel, which is great. But I think one of the things that Mikel was saying was that you can't expect Saliba to do that for five years. You you, you can't, so you have to try and find a solution. Um, yeah, you, I want your thoughts on that. Well, kind of like how we spoke in the, in the scouted of him, you know, I, I do think he's got major central Which you can check back. out on the Canon podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Not to self-plug, but I do think he has uh, a lot of central center back tendencies. It's absolutely possible. I mean, we saw Gabriel do that last year and Calafiori is a far better player for that type of role. Look, he's just somebody that's able to lead the build up on his own. Like one of Calafiori's biggest strengths is his ability to kind of almost prep bit, uh, press bait opposition. So he'll draw players in and he'll release it at the right time in terms of progression. He's not afraid to have a large arsenal, pun intended, in terms of how he's able to do that with both passing as well as carrying. And so 
I think from a Macau perspective, like you look at Saliba and he is uh, the one that dictates the tempo for Arsenal at the back, right? Like he is somebody that is that anchor. And I think from a perspective of not just giving Saliba rest, but giving that role a rest is equally important. I think people um, are too set. I don't know if it's because of formations or FIFA, or I I really don't know where this happened, but um, people want to tweak or coaches will want to tweak instances where you want certain qualities on the pitch. And that doesn't always have to be from your specific profile. So for example, um, look at Ben White. There's moments when we want an inverted Ben White as opposed to somebody that's overlapping. There are instances when we would want Ben White to maybe be a little bit more reserved and maintain more of a back three. There are instances that I would like that flexibility on the left, but I don't have enough profiles to be able to do that. And so recruiting that gives you that flexibility and it no longer becomes easy or rather it becomes incredibly hard for oppositionists now and guess, okay, what are Arsenal going to do? If you're going to set up against Arsenal and I'm setting up a press, by the way, how in the world are you going to set up against a goalkeeper that operates the highest line in the league? Okay. How are you going to operate when you've got two central six, two, six, three center backs that are incredibly quick that are able to operate both centrally in a John Stones role, who by the way, is his, uh, is, is his kind of inspiration. Reference him. Yeah. Yep. Um, how are you going to do that again with fullbacks like Yuri and Timber who's comfortable either side who can invert, who can go on the overlap, who can play in midfield. Like the flexibility on show also means by the way, Arteta can signal and say, okay, Ben, I want you to go from overlapping to inverted. In Calafiore, I want you to go overlapping from inverted. And that can happen in game without yep. a substitution. Like we talk, we, we use substitutes as our only thinking yep. um, in the in kind of modern fan culture of the way to change a game. In my opinion, the whole point of recruiting these multiple profiles is that you can change in game, that coaches yep. have setups for specific points. And they, it's going to become a lot more technical where my biggest prediction is going to be you're going to have segments of a game with a game plan that differs. So by minute 20, there's going to be a signal and a switch. And that's going to result in different pressures, in different intentions. And that really is what coaching is all about. It's not necessarily the spaces you occupy. It's how you arrive into those spaces. Yeah, I think that's really well said. I think, yeah, I mean, how do you set up? But yeah, but as you say, not only how do you set up for the first minute, how do you set up a minute 20 and how do you set up a minute 30? And th- that's the exciting part, really. I, yeah, I, I'm so excited to see how, how that all sort of develops and how that unfolds. I, I, I think it will be really, and also David Raya. I mean, I'm writing a, a video for a different knock at the minute plug about how David Raya, I think, might take a little step up next season. I think there might be a sort of, but actually not necessarily from him, I think he'll improve a bit, but more the perception of him. Because I think it was kind of stuttered last season because of the Ramsdale situation from an outside perspective. I think once people see how good we are in build-up, everyone's profile will be raised. Gabriel, I think, will you know might sort of hopefully finally externally get the respect he, he deserves. People like David Raya, even Ben White. I think once you, when you're part of something so good for so long as a group, the individuals start to sort of sort of rise within it. Um, yeah, and I mean, Babs, just to maybe close out on this, like. I know you're going to hate this on the pod next year, but there isn't going to be an answer. It's going to be, okay, well, today we want a you know three at the back in in this zone and then they start pressing with the twos. So we want to shut that down. We want to overload them. So let's change this or whatever. That's that's so exciting it's to me. It's football. That's football. It's football. That's total football. And also it gives us more to break down. You know, when you play the yeah. exact same lineup every single game with the exact same tactics, at one point it gets boring. You know, as content creators as well, you, you talk about him being amazing, King being needing to improve. It's same old, same old. So to have the idea of changing tactics in certain games gives us content creators and fans more to digest as well. And football is changing, you know. I mean, look, who knew Phil took five years ago? I didn't. George. <laughs> right? <laughs> but it, it, nowadays, football fans consume football differently. Yeah. Uh, we yeah. could have a very good game, but fans might go on social media after and see like the XG, the field and go, oh, that was in our favour. Yeah. Maybe we weren't that good. You know, yeah. we, look, we look at ratings nowadays more and more as well. So for me, I'm, I'm actually more excited to, to break down different parts of the last one. I don't want it to be the exact same thing every year because, you know, I, I want it to be intriguing. I want it to be different. Yeah, sometimes I've got some answers, but it's fine, man. We'll, we'll get it from Mikel Arteta. Or I'll, I'll give uh, Zinchenko a shout. Maybe you'll give me something. <laughs> Yeah, give him a text. Yeah, I'm sure you could DM him at this point, I'm sure. Yeah, so maybe could. maybe send him your five things could. five things we learned. You know what? Yeah, I think yeah. There's just one thing that I wanted to to just talk about really quickly because it fits when we're talking about Califiori and we're talking about windows and we're talking about what's happening. Um, I kind of made a post really quickly on X and I just don't know. I'd throw this out for people to mull over. 
have a look at our left hand side and our right hand side and look at the personality differences that we're potentially hoping to acquire in the window. And we could kind of assume with Mikel Moreno rumors really hotting up at this point. And, you know, I think Fabrizio Romano even just tweeted something along the lines of the, you know, Atletico and Barcelona have conceded that Arsenal are kind of in the, in the driving seat at this point. If you look at a pod of Calafiore, uh, uh, even Moreno, and as well, uh, there we go. There we go. <laughs> I want to give you one. And, Thank you, and, mate. And Martinelli, um, even Gabriel. Like, have a look at the left hand side. So, Gabriel, Calafiore, Moreno, uh, Martinelli. How does that compare in the press? What is the personality of that? They're all very over aggressive jumpers. They're incredibly, they're the hunters, I like to call them. They will chase anything. One of the biggest things that people misinterpret about Marino is that the reason his dual success and completeness is so large is because he's incredibly jumpy. When people start to think about the Declan Rice role of last year, when they saw him high up the pitch, jumping to players, that is what Marino absolutely excels at. So when you look at that as a personality trait on the left, and then you have a look on the right, in terms of the controlled aggression that we see between Saliba, Ben White, Martin Odegaard, Bakayo Saka. There's a really nice balance. And personally, my biggest prediction of next year, we're going to see much more instances of the left forcing play to the right to trap. And I think that's going to become a much bigger emphasis and play moving forward. I also think we're seeing more switches. I could be wrong in the early preseason. We will. I, th- I, th- I think we're seeing more switches already. In, in it was preseason. inevitable. Uh, we were so poor know, at them no. last it year. It was. I did see some training specifically of that exact thing. Really? You, you had Gabriel and Kivio just switch off the switch, off the switch. And uh, you had, um, I think Yovo was on the other side. Interesting. And, and there's a few passes that were going astray, but they kept doing that. It was, they they yeah. basically throw the ball in, they head it down a few times, and then switch it across the pitch to the, yeah. to the other side of it. Mate, Not it directly was switch, but right to the corner it, flag area. It, it was inevitable. We were 17th in the league for switches. It was, and you know, the whole article that Declan came out with, like this idea that you know, Mikel doesn't like switches, I found ridiculous because guys, what was Mikel? biggest reason for winning the FA Cup it was early switches out to Aubameyang from David Luiz like this idea that Mikel doesn't like switches was some of the most ridiculous discourse that I saw I do believe that it was something that our players weren't brave enough to do and we weren't completing it enough but you know I I, I think with Calafiore specifically that outlet out to Saka is going to be something that we'll really see quite often and I think that we'll start to see the Declan Rice switch out to Martinelli or the William Saliba and Ben White switch out to Martinelli. We're going to start to see that. Mm. Yeah. Well, I thought we saw it more in the preseason games. We'll come to them in just a second. Um, okay, let's talk this. Fulham have agreed a £34 million or £43.7 million. Thank you, you guys out there. You're welcome. <laughs> Deal to sign Emil Smith Rowe dollars uh, from Arsenal. The West London side will pay £27 million up front with £7 million due in potential add ons. The Athletic reported last week that Fulham were near an agreement to sign Smith Rowe, who would become their club record arrival. Um, perhaps I'm interested in, in sort of anything that's been said on the ground over in over in Philly. Um, it's, it's curious. And I'm also curious on this. I think there's been a little bit of rewriting of history with the Millsmith row. I think it's, look, I, I think there's, there's a bit of a profile gap, which we'll come to in a second. And George, I want to talk to you about that. Um, and sort of how we <clears throat> replace or don't replace, or what do we do with sort of the Smith row gap in the squad? And what do we do with the number 10 shirt, which is the main, main question really. But I do feel Babs like, look, Smith row did a fantastic job in what was it? 2020 and 2021 that game, 26th of December, 2020, he was instrumental. He was really, really important. But I do sense there's this little sort of uh, narrative creeping in from those who probably don't like the sale. And there will be some people watching, and this is fair, and I, w- I want to talk about it, who were sort of like Smith Rowe saved Arteta's job. And I, d- I don't know. I don't love that narrative. I think it's a little bit, it's a little bit reductive. And I, the reason why is... Firstly, Smith Rowe was brilliant that game, but I think sometimes games in retrospect get blown up and blown out of proportion. He was brilliant. I'm not saying he wasn't brilliant, but some people talk about it like it was Gerard in Istanbul. But it's like, okay, it was a good game. Chill out. And secondly, Arteta had just been promoted at the time, we forget this, to the first team manager. He'd gone two and a half months previously from head coach to manager and both Vinay and Edu sat down for an interview, COVID, I remember they were separated and they said, Mikel is doing a brilliant job at the minute. I think we slightly overestimate how 
at risk Arteta's job was. And the reason I say that is not just to sort of bring it up as a as a point of interest. It's also to some, kind of frame the Smith Rowe conversation now. Because I think some some of the resistance to this, I think, is based in that, if you see what I mean. Mm-hmm. And I don't mm-hmm. really agree with it. And I want to get your take on it. So at that time of the year, I remember that very vividly, we were seven games without a win. So even if Mikel had got the promotion, it was seven games without a win. And we're going to play against Chelsea, our rivals at the Emirates Stadium, it's Boxing Day. And no one expects to win, you know. And I think that's why it was not less he saved Mikel to his job, but he gave us energy for that second half of the season. Mm-hmm. Because we were 15th at that time. There was even talk of relegation. You know, I found obviously the quote of, um, they were talking asking Saka and, and Co about that. But there was, I remember at the time, there were people talking about, oh, Arsenal have got relegation clauses in the contracts. I'm like, what? So it, as maybe it's not the exact game. I don't think there's one game that saved Mikel Arteta's job, that's for sure. But it's a massive game in Mikel Arteta's career. Because it, t- it was a natural turning point of the season where we'd been so bad for the first half. And one of the final games of the first half, see, we go and beat Chelsea. We go and, I think, go on a 3-4 winning streak and climb the table. I think that there was massive for fans to go, OK, look, there's youngsters coming through. There's, there's stuff to believe in now. You know, you look at Man United right now with the likes of Manu and Garnacho and Cohen. Fans believe right now in the team more because they've got the young players they can identify with. So for most people to come in, drop a masterclass against Kante as well and go and help us to get the victory. I think that's what it was. It's not like a one-off game to save Mikel job and Kroenke was better and they're going, oh, right, we can keep him now. But yeah. I, I don't think we can underestimate how important it was when you're seven games out of defeat and you come in unexpectedly and you help us to win against a, a side, you know, that was five of Champions League football. I think that's massive. It, 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 it's undoubtedly, and I don't wish to downplay it, it was a really important moment in in the, in the, the whole conversation around Arsenal and Arteta, 100%. My point is more that I think sometimes that now is colour, and I also would, I, I would pull it down from maybe a 10 out of 10 to a 9 out of 10. And yeah. I would suggest that I think it's slightly colouring the conversation around the sale is what I'm saying. Really. Of course, of course. No, you it, think I think fans want to write the perfect fairy, fairy tale storyline as well. I think that's what it is. Well, you fans want to give it a, you know, that way as well. I got a question for both of you though, because I don't think it's necessarily the Arteta job thing, but he did save the season in terms of the quality. Yeah. And I think what the argument is at least, why people are annoyed is it's about the quality of the player. That's really what it comes down to. I don't even think it's a Mikel conversation because it's, it is a sample of six months, which is significant. You can't say that it's insignificant, that he genuinely was performing at one of the best players in the league level. That's what he was doing. And the number of goals that he was able to achieve from midfield in six months, and not just that, but his general influence on games, that's the debate because the debate is can Emil survive and do this? I mean... From my perspective, it, it's really difficult to contextualize because you're talking about a player who hasn't played for two years and is still able to garner a 34 million pound fee. I mean, I, I think it says volumes both ways. Like we're talking about quality debate on the player and the pushback, at least from somebody that loves Emil Smith Rowe. I've always been somebody that says you can't get hung up on names in a team. Names shouldn't dictate what logic or what's good for a club. What should be is a good process. So if you find somebody that's better at doing the job of that player, then do it. If you find somebody that's able to do the job more regularly than that player and is an upgrade in those qualities, then make the transition. But the debate has been more colored on the fact that Emil Smith Rowe is shit and is chubby and eats Nando's. Sorry, like that's that's one narrative that people do push back on. And they prop up that period, in my opinion, to... I mean, this is not me, but I'm saying they prop up that period to counter this idea that he's a poor player, that he doesn't yeah. fit. Like moving on, and that I think is the debate over the Arteta thing. Look, who knows? I do agree with Babs. I think after seven games of a winless, you never know. It doesn't matter who's the manager, and you don't know the future. But if that had gone eight, nine, ten games, I don't think any manager in world football is safe under those conditions. But it's yeah. more so that he saved the season. He saved the Arsenal season with his play of over six months. And I think that is what people use as evidence for the quality of the player that he can be, let alone the potential. I, th- I think I have two things to, to push back on that. One is that at the time, I mean, this is four years ago now, and we were playing, we came eighth. We were playing at a very different level. The league was in a different place. And that's not to doubt, again, the problem is when whenever you sort of push back against, you know, he, he saved this. I, I basically, I don't, I think he was part of saving the season. I'm like, if, if you're a, a, a A, I'm pulling back to A1. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's like, I'm just, I'm just going slightly back. 
I think he was part of saving the season. I think he was a big part of it. And I think he was an important player. And obviously, I'm not, I'm not trying to discredit credit that. But I think the thing I struggle with is I can't see... If as long as we replace the profile, and and I think there is a profile gap now in in the squad, but you know we we're, we're nowhere near the end of the window, so we've got to wait and see. I think if we finish the window without signing a sort of carry uh, carry first sort of combine around the edge of the box in midfield, I, th- I think that would be a, a bit of a miss. I'd, I'd wait and see, but I think I, I would feel that would be a bit of a miss. But I don't personally, if we're able to do that, see any downside in this in this sale. I think we're looking at a player who hasn't played for two years and I think there's a there's a reason for that and you know obviously some of it is, is body it's not a simple you know, straight linear line curve but I think we're looking at a time the, the sample that we're pointing to is four years ago now and it's it's at a different time for the club it's at a different time for for the player playing with the sort of fearlessness of youth without the injuries and stuff and I just I don't know I, I think some people are sort of using that period as you say George to kind of prop mm-hmm. up okay well that's why we shouldn't sell the player and I, I just sort of go I think thanks for the memories and I'm not saying that was a bad period but I don't think that should be used as a reason to keep the player around I, I don't think that's enough for me I Basil, think, I want to get your take. yeah yeah sorry. go ahead Babs. so I, I don't think fans necessarily say we keep them for that specific reason I think it's just it's a throwback it's a memory I, I've seen people say it I mean look this is all nar- narrative yeah, like the conversation it's Twitter fans. It's actually I mean, not. It's not real. It's, it's, oh, no, it's in it's person. Friends, friends yeah, and I think it's, look, it's, he's a fan's favourite and there's a reason behind it. He's a number 10. He's come through our academy. We've seen it from a young time. We've heard about the Croyd and KDB and we've seen him, you know, help a season, revive last season as well. So th- there's obviously a league to him straight away, you know. Like, I think if, if you put, if I put myself back in 2020, December 2020, and as someone who's still back in Mikel Arteta, even through that seven game winning streak, one of the things I used was the second half of the year to kind of help Mikel, you know, gain some support back in the fan base. I go, look, second half of the year, with the Millsmore front of the team, we were like Champions League form. And that was massive, but it was hope. We needed hope at that time. If we had continued the same route the first half of the season and ended like 10th, 11th, I'm not sure if I had had that same hope. But seeing a number 10 in the team and helping us thrive straight away gave, gave fans something to believe for the season after that. So I think that's that's a major part. And, and I won't forget that person at the time either. And I know at the time people were saying, oh, you know, season's starting, it isn't starting Christmas and stuff. But it, it was something that was talked about, right? And that is for sure as well. But I think in terms of keeping a mill, I think I'm for that, you know, I think it's a fantastic deal, by the way. £35 million pounds for a player, up to £35 million pounds for a player, who hasn't scored since 2022 and only had three starts last year. I mean, on paper, that's a significant yeah, fun. Really and I, that's the feeling I got around the club anyways. Even speaking to people around, I'm like, you know, what did you think about the deal? And they, they, they think it's an amazing deal because yeah. they, they, you know, look at a player that go like he's important to us in terms of the heritage and stuff, but in terms of first team value, current first team value, and how much he's played and that you know how much would he be worth in a year's time because i don't think he's gonna be a start for Arsenal next year anyways how much would he be worth 25 million pounds maybe you know so i think it was the perfect time to cash in for the player himself as well i think he was keen on the move because he wants to go and thrive somewhere else and be a star and he's got the likes of you know alex orby as well so there's a hill and connection straight away but i think yeah, yeah. i follow him he can he can thrive straight away he's it's also in london as also as, as a player himself he's like the, the move cities and stuff for him. I, th- I think exactly and he can thrive straight away and it's a club that it's, it's a premier it's a secure premier league club that make a move to stay there got a good manager as well i think it's an amazing deal look i yeah. think the retort has to come in for both of you like what do you think he does let's assume you give 10 games of sample of emil smith Rowe playing in the premier league in a marco silva system with a significant overlap from robinson what could he do and i think that's the debate so you're coloring of whether or not it's a good sale or not and maybe people that are debating whether it's a good sale or not is going to depend on that because people point to a three-year reference previously, but ultimately you got to perform and you got to prove it. But I'm telling you, if Emile Smith Rowe was to replicate what he did in 2021 in the current market, that's more than 34 million pounds. It's much more than 34 million pounds. And that's the bet that Fulham are making. They made him their club record signing. That's the bet that a lot of people in clubs, by the way, make with Emile Smith Rowe, because it wasn't just that RB Leipzig were willing to go and pay for him after surgery without having played at all. He's got a very unique profile in the team. And I'll end on this because Alex, you know, we had been talking on the podcast for so long about having somebody that could receive in tight spaces, turn and drive. That was equally just as much as central progression was an issue last year, was having somebody reliable, high up the pitch that can receive in tight spaces, turn and play into the box, whether through a pass or through a carry. And I will say not recruiting that skill does lead the squad short. And I don't mind in the terms of him being sold, but we need to recruit that because that's something that Arsenal struggled with. And by the way, I really don't think we will. 
I don't think that we'll look to do that. I think we'll look to do it in different ways. I think we'll try to get the wingers inside, and I think that we'll try to have other people have different intents. But I do think that that type of profile won't be recruited this summer, and it doesn't look to be either. I think we'd be sure if we didn't have that profile, but I also think my concerns are waylaid by us, by the return of Timber, by the usage of Calafiori, also with Marino a little bit, because I, I do see that. I mean, we saw it in the scouting, George, the ability to receive on the back foot and, and play that ball quickly. I think the issues we were trying to fix could be fixed by Emil Smith-Rowe, which is why we were calling him for him last year. Um, but I think they can be mostly waylaid, I, I, I feel, in theory. However, do I still feel there'll be a bit of a profile gap? Yeah, I, I don't know. Well, I'm just not I'm not as sold on the profile gap. What do you guys think about Ifo Wanyeri's role on the team next year? I don't think it's a direct replacement for Smith-Rowe, but um, as a midfielder there, you know, Smith-Rowe uh, going, I think there's a there's an opportunity there for Wanyeri to get promoted you know, in a bigger first-team role. I think he'll be a lot closer to goal. Yeah. What I look, what I look at one year and I look, I look at someone. I go, the quality he shows around the box in terms of the tempo, the reverse passes, the ability to hold it, even hold it up, and the sort of the usage of his body. I see a player, George, and I, you probably watched him more than me, but I see a player. The more I watch him, the more I think that's a player who's closer to goal. He's more to me like a winger, second striker than he is an eight or a six. That that's mm. that's closer to what I, I or a ten. Do you know it's what I mean? Because in, I, I see in preseason, I've seen him play at times drop a bit deeper pick up the ball and you know, play in tight spaces you can see how comfortable he's in that area straight away i'm sure so he can just, do that yeah, i'm sure he can i think do that, that level of quality I, I i think i could see mikhail attempt maybe platforming towards that rather than a number 10 because that's what he's currently being used at and i think next year in terms of profiles that i also really have i think one year's profile is something that we don't really have right now someone that can do that and be very I've talked you know, secure it. in between the lines yeah. yeah i've talked about it in the past i've talked about it on this pod like if you want a profile comparison for me it's more mudrich than it is that final third. I think what makes Ethan really exciting though, is that he's got such a brilliant uh, kind of ball striking trait. So like getting near the box and arriving in the box again, I think we're coaching a Martin Odegaard rule upgrade in general, somebody that's able to dictate the play that's able to drop in deep next to the pivot that can control those things, but then have the freedom and flexibility to crash the box and to impact things in the final third in that way. I think, you know, when, when you look at somebody, I think he's not necessarily a winger because he's not the quickest from a standstill. He's very quick in terms of his running power and he's secure, but he's not explosive in that sense. So I don't think that you're looking, um, even with somebody as an overlap, like that's how he'll integrate to get used to men's football. But really his final form for me is not a six, absolutely not. He's an eight ten, but he is more of that half space player that would affect play in all phases. I think he's an all-phase central midfielder. I think that's nat- naturally, I want to say close to the box, that's what I see him at the minute. That's naturally the career of most, I feel like most, even Fabregas, you know, that, that they, they spend time. It's almost the, what I see is that is the usefulness of him makes him make the decisions and sort of be brave around the box, which it's is when he can be effective. But yeah, yeah, he can, can be effective in, in, in those areas and probably will then drop back a little bit later in his career. It's why but Miles was, is also, by the way, wide. Like it's just a classic coaching thing. Yeah, you, yeah, put, yeah. you put young yeah. players wide. Aaron Ramsey, we saw it. Yeah, you put wide players wide because if they do make a mistake, it's easier for the team to recover. Yeah. You make a mistake in the middle of the park, it's harder to. So that's, that's typically what happens. We did have a game. Against Manchester United, which we haven't talked about yet. Uh, I did stay awake for it. Congratulations to me. <laughs> Actually, to, to, there was, at the end, I think I missed the last five minutes with a little. Um, but uh, it was interesting. We obviously Double won. Fair. Martinelli scored a great goal. Uh, who's the other goal scored? Oh, went in one year with the assist and the Where? Jesus one. Jesus. Um, I want to talk about, actually I want to talk about two players from this game. Because I, I, I feel like with preseason games, it's, it's hard to sort of talk about the system. I mean, we could talk a little bit about the disjointedness of the press, but I mean, there's sort of no Reece point doing good, that. mate. Reese looked Reece really, really good. good. Do you want to go on that, George? I, 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 I was watching that and I was going, this is a guy who's been coached by Mikel for the last four or five years and probably beyond that. He's going to bang wherever he goes and it's going to be so frustrating. Yeah. I don't want to sell him for peanuts and not replace him. That would really upset me. He is the easiest guarantee of a winger in the league He's getting really you 15 good. goals and assists. That is, if we signed him from Hoffenheim this summer, we'd be buzzing. Mate, we'd he, be buzzing. The work we've done with him too is so frustrating yeah. because I think he's finally ready. He feels like he belongs. There's a certain level of with Reese that I'm looking now, I'm looking with authority. Every time he's on the ball, he's making things happen. Reese's talent has never been in question. Reese, for me, to give you an idea of how much I rate Reese, I thought he has the quickest feet in the squad. 
you're going to isolate that trait of dribbling. He has, he has potentially the quickest feet in the squad. He's got incredible running power. And the only issues is, ironically, he had a bit of the Kai Havertz mentality earlier in his career. He never asserted himself like he did in the academy. And he never applied his talent in terms of being aggressive enough in possession to show the quality that he has. Now, I'm seeing impact at every single cameo, at every single match, and he looks like a leader. He, for me, in this preseason, looked like one of the captains, in a sense. He looked like he's been there for years, and it, it's so frustrating because I don't think that there's a willingness for us to use those assets, but I'm telling you right now, mate, he is a player that if he goes to West Ham, he will kill it at West Ham. It's another player that I think we forget, mate, because we're selling these players and because they're homegrown and we've seen them for so long, there's a certain level of talent misrepresentation with it. So, uh, so yeah. Yeah, I, th- I think... I think with Reese and Emil and Eddie, you're right. Like th- there's a real talent there, and we kind of because they they're playing the squad role that they are, we maybe forget about that. The one thing I will say is like you can't save every single talent, and you can't stockpile every single talent in the world. I think if when push comes to shove, we would say Reese probably needs to go somewhere else. But it's a shame because he's he's such a talented player. But you know, I think I think we have to accept the level we're at now. I mean, we are really, really good. Um, but there was a really exciting uh, debut. Debut? No, second debut uh, from Aiden Heaven, who, yes, okay, he got done by by Hoyland. It happened. I think I think I said he, uh, you know, he's one of the quickest and most most powerful strikers in the world. I would actually agree with him in terms of the physical uh, side of things. But Baz, what I was really impressed by, and to be honest, the only thing I really care about with uh, a player of that age is how he responded. He is smooth, man. And at 17, the way he responded after getting, look, he was just on his heels. <laughs> it yeah, happens. Yeah. I've been done like that on, on football field. It happens. And yeah. I was really impressed by how he responded. I've been really impressed by him. I don't, like. I think if you look at the eight defenders ahead of him, there's probably no chance he gets proper first team or meaningful, certainly first team minutes mm-hmm. this season. But I was really impressed by it in heaven. Yeah, if I'm right in saying he's actually a defensive midfielder, he's playing at centre-back, so he's not even a natural centre-back. So for him to to play then the first list is trust from Mikel, but also like every game he's grown into, he's had moments, you know, sort of against Bournemouth as well, but that's character and it shows as a young fighter as well. I think, funny thing was after the game uh, in, in the mix zone, I think he was running a bit late and they, they had to get the coach, so he just seemed just dash past like a young kid and the yeah. coach goes, Come on, son! You're gonna miss the coach, uh, you know. And uh, and I was like, you know, he just, just, just said, for Arsenal, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, he played for Arsenal. And yeah, I mean, him and all the youngsters. I think Josh Nichols is another one who came on in the second half, and he was very nice. Um, we actually met his mother, I think, and she's she's very nice as well. And, and just to speak to her and seeing some players, well, what you notice straight away, these these young players. It is like a, you could sense the dream. You could feel mm. how it is for them. You want to walk past you. If, if other guy walks past you, he's like, he knows he's here, Ben White. And the young players walk past you, they're just like very shy. Like, oh my God, I'm, I'm here at Arsenal and there's press guys there. And it's just, it's crazy. Actually, there was one youngster I won't name, um, but he was, uh, he walked past the press, the mixer, and he was, he was asked basically, are you ready for the Premier League this season? And he asked, he replied with, what do you think? <laughs> and just walked off. As in... And then, what, as and in, what, of course I am, or as I, in, no, no chance. I think, of course I am. Oh, I so, think we all know who that is. Okay, interesting. Yeah. So look, honestly, <laughs> I think time. the young players, the young players <laughs> now, you can tell right now is they what believe in themselves. <laughs> and um, why can't yeah. you say who it is? Come on. I can't. I actually, I, I okay. actually can't say who it is. Okay. So, but yeah, look, look, it is. It's, you can see these guys are ready for it, technically, mentally, and and you know they're up for the challenge. Okay, so George, it was one of Ethan or Miles. So uh... <laughs> not Ethan. That doesn't sound like his personality. But um, but yeah, it's uh, look. I I do think that when you have a look at the number of youth players that have come, it's a nice change. And I think that the way that Arsenal have developed certain youth, you can see it's a clear prototype. Like look at Aiden Heaven, look at Miles Lewis Kelly, and look at Ethan Winery. By the way, Aiden is not a centre back, and he is being coached in the centre back to teach a lot of the defensive issues that he's had. He's really a free eight. So when you're talking about how smooth he operates on the on the ball, it's because he's a natural midfielder. Like he was never the reason is his frame grew so big. And I mean Arsenal from a coaching staff perspective. Also, Loki are probably saying, listen, mate, the competition in midfield's huge. If you can double up his versatility as a center back, that's your in in terms of playing minutes earlier, if that's what you want. And so being able to coach that is important. But yeah, this is this is a guy that for me has incredible technique. Like if you actually look towards it, a lot of people in his early years kind of compared him to more of the Pogba type, 
in terms of him being that really tall, rangy midfielder that's box to box that can really have a supreme amount of technique, but plays with that physical edge. Like, you know how Pogba, what made him really special was not just the technique, but there was a physicality to the way that he received and dominated players in the field. That's what Aiden was doing in younger age groups, you know, lower than U16s. And as he was advanced, I think his entrance into the first team now has been really through center back. I don't think that's his long-term future, by the way, at all, by the way. But um, yeah, he was really, really good. And I mean, Saladin was another one that I thought did well in terms of the tour. A couple of really good moments. Um, But generally speaking, I think it's really great to see Mikel embrace it. There was a recent interview that, you know, that came out and Mikel was talking about, you know, his worries about using academy players. And the idea that he has a responsibility to know that if it goes wrong, it's on him. And mate, it's actually one of the most rawest interviews. I think it was a brilliant interview. Um, and it's one of the realest explanations I've seen from Mikel's hesitance to using youth. I don't think it's a good enough excuse, generally speaking, in terms of the minutes that we've seen, but something that I can understand. And in it, it mentions, along with the idea of competing week in and week out and the pressure of getting at Arsenal back to actually winning a trophy, one thing he doesn't want mentally is this idea of ruining a youngster. And I just wonder if he's just seen so much throughout his career. I mean, you have to think, look back at Arteta in terms of him as a player. How many players did he see whose careers ruined during our era with that? Yeah. That must have played a bigger role, not just the pep yeah. comparison, uh, and, but and his also, idea of that. And culturally, like, you know, he's been playing, he was playing, he started playing in like early 2000s. Like, you know, it's a very, it's a very different time. He did it culturally do you know what i mean like so you know yeah. the amount of the, the the way academy players are treated now is very very different to where it was 20 years ago yeah i mean this is i mean kind of bring, brings us back to what we we're saying at the beginning of the, the, the show controlling the narrative because you can completely understand that and now you can kind of factor that into the conversation and the sort of the youth debate that can be something that people are, are sort of aware of because you know it is of course you're dealing with young people you're dealing with you know i, I know we've spoken about before like at what point do you start talking about a player at 15 16 17 like these are these are children so, you know, analyzing a player, you can praise them, you know, they're in the public eye, Aiden Heaven, the kids 17, but the club have put him forward. But, you know, before they're in the public spotlight, you know, people like us who are analyzing stuff, they, there is an ethical responsibility there. And that and that is definitely part of it. The final player, because I want to talk about, uh, we wanted to come on to sort of the Premier League because it's starting in a couple of weeks, but we've got lots of time to do that. The final player that I wanted to talk about from the game I was really impressed by. And actually, there was just, it was just a run about five minutes in that Gabriel Jesus made. And I went, okay. Okay. I think there's some quotes from him. Uh, I've got them somewhere. I'm sure I can get them up. But basically, essentially all around uh, his fitness and feeling as though he had... Uh, here, here they are. My last preseason was not good because I was feeling my knee. So I had to have surgery and missed all of the preseason. This season is different. I can enjoy my holidays and then I trained a lot and I was focused to come back well and do a good preseason. Now I'm in a different shape and I can play football again. Which is interesting because, you know, Jesus was fine last season. But he was basically saying I wasn't fit. So I think it's really exciting, Babs. I'll come back to you uh, on this. I... Look, I don't think Jesus is going to be our out-and-out number nine anymore. I, I think I predicted that in a, a video about over a year ago now. I, I haven't seen that. I think the Sheshko thing, <laughs> plug, I think the Sheshko thing um, has kind of confirmed that. I think Habert's obviously been found at centre forward. I, I don't think we'll see him there. But that does not mean Gabriel Jesus will get him out. I think he can contribute so much. I think when you look at... If he can find that physical burst, what, what we were talking about on the podcast at the end of last year was all about his burst. If he gets that back, is I sort of I think at the time I remember comparing it to Bayern. I think it's a different thing, but that almost it feels like that burst and that that first five yards underpins so much of his game that it's kind of a superpower. But if he can get that back, if we can go back to the Jesus we saw pre World Cup twenty twenty two wherever that is on the pitch left eight <laughs> i think uh, it's a joke um i think um to be clear I- i'm really excited i think i think jesus could have a really good big season ahead of him yeah i think mikhail said in his prayer conference that um he's he's seen a different jesus right now in terms of he's come back very fit very sharp and physically as well i think he looks a bit leaner and uh, you could sense that straight away with how he's playing he's definitely more free as well and i think there was that you talk about a run i think there's another run in the second half as well you burst past the play and he got cut off towards the end of it but his way just burst past the fullback and that there is a positive sign of a player also has belief in himself again to go and take players on and that's a massive part of his game you know talk about last year and there was that massive moment against Bayern Munich when he came off the bench and he just took over the game and helped to score the score the winning uh, score the equalizing goal as well and i think the quality is undeniable that's for sure and if we can get that jesus 22 23 i mean that striker at least guarantees you at least 20 
20 goals and assists, you know, whether it's 15 goals and 7 assists or something like that, he'll, he'll get make sure he gets those numbers because he, throughout his entire career, I think he's one of Man City's highest top goal scorers and even yeah, there he missed like so many chances. Yeah. yeah, do you know what I mean? Now, there's not many players that we get that, but, you know, he's a very good goal scorer. I think under Pep is always one of his highest ever goal scorers. So I think he misses a lot of chances and fans kind of, it builds a narrative around him that he's not a good goal scorer, but his numbers have always been very, very good. And so to have him in a squad next year, maybe not as a guaranteed start, is testament to Arsenal's team because he's a very good player. And for most clubs in the league, he starts guaranteed. But because because we're so good right now and so, so complete in terms of going forwards at times as well and all the options that we have, we don't have to start him straight away. But I think even asking Mikel about Havertz after and him saying we're only playing Havertz in midfield now because we're short enough, short, short numbers says to me that habits may still be our number nine for next season and jesus might get games as well and we'll see but if he's fully fit and we get 22 23 then we are cooking something very we nice are cooking. we something are cooking very something nice. very nice <laughs> uh george just finish up with you then how do you see jesus being used next season not and not only sort of sort of in terms of the minutes and stuff but also literally on the pitch um where do you see his best position I've always felt that he's more of a winger than he is a, a striker broadly. Like even when Jose came in, I just felt like, no, this is a player that obviously has brilliant qualities, a versatile attacker that can play across the front line. But if you want to maximize Jesus, for me, he was always a brilliant winger playing off somebody, uh, ideally a second striker, really. Uh, you know, you look at Julian Alvarez and, you know, if you can play him off a big man. That's where Jesus would like to thrive, where he doesn't have the responsibility of being the main person you go to, but can float in pockets, pick up space, and really drive at the ball centrally. That's that's where you get the best out of him. And I think, in general, one of his best positions is playing right wing. People forget one of his most successful seasons with Manchester City was him playing right wing, one of his most productive seasons. And I think it's because it gives him a level of clarity because Jesus is such a chaos player. Naturally, he's somebody that... His instinct takes over his game, and that can be a detriment and a positive because it's impossible to defend against, and it's impossible to predict, but also it's impossible to control. And so from a coaching perspective, you want to see that more in wide areas to give you separation to attack. And I think at center forward, you need a bit more of a platforming and reliability in terms of your sturdiness to receive and play off of, especially how Arsenal used their strikers to do those things. And so for me, I'm, I'm interested to see whether or not we can see that burst back because what you're talking about is not even just the turn because he's, I think even after injury, he was always quick on the half turn. I don't see him any less agile. Even in these initial games, it's that carry, that intense running power. You know, the Leicester, Maisie runs, you know, it, 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 it's almost a case of, is he going to lose it? He almost has it under control, but he doesn't. His carries and the longer the carries go the less control he gets under but those brilliant flashes give you moments and he is a moment player so from an arsenal perspective i think it's just brilliant to have a jesus who's got value and mate that's 265k a week on the bench like we need to use it that's arguably the biggest waste of funds if we don't use it and we're unable to see it so um, I think he's just backing up the promise and why I and many people said, I think he has the biggest uh, kind of stock rising of preseason. Mm. And it looks to be the case. And you yep. can just see he has to. He's playing for his career and you can see it. Yeah, you can see it. No, I think it's a good way of putting it. Um, maybe he is the moments player. Maybe the moments player was the friend we made along the way. <laughs> oh, How about God. that? Uh, thank you guys so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Uh, you can check out the kind of podcast uh, on YouTube, on Spotify, on Apple, and that sort of stuff. George and I, I'm sure, will be doing some form of something later on in the week. Scouting <laughs> it or we'll, we'll work out in a minute. Um, pleasure as always. Uh, Babs, when are you back from America? I'm back on Friday morning. On Friday morning. Friday morning. Two weeks exactly before the Premier League starts. I, something back. came up on my YouTube pilot earlier. It was the it was the Chelsea. United game where Cole Palmer scored the hat trick. Uh, you know, the like the last minute winner. I, I okay. just I miss the, the Premier League so much. Yeah, I mean, I mean, doesn't sure, count. but <laughs> it does it doesn't count. Yeah, but I just miss the Premier League so much, man. I can't wait for it to come back. Yeah. Um, pleasure as always. Thank you guys so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Uh, make sure you like and subscribe and all that good stuff. Check out George on X at No New Thing. Check out Bavs on X at Trolling Chelsea Fans. Whatever you are. Um, and yeah, thanks as always. And thanks for keeping it Arsenal. Peace.